All right. Hello, everyone. Um, and welcome to the Mystery Writers of America, America's mm -hmm. annual symposiums. Tonight's discussion is with the nominees for the Simon & Schuster Mary Higgins Clark Award. Our moderator is Kara Ruda, and I'll be introducing her in a minute. You can learn more about Mystery Writers of America and the Edgar Awards by following us on social media using the hashtag Edgars2024 and by visiting the websites mysterywriters.org and edgars.com. A reminder that the Edgar Awards will be live streamed on our YouTube channel on May 1st, which may be where you're watching this as well right now. And during tonight's discussion, I'll be posting links to our panelists' books in the chat. Our featured bookstore today is Centuries and Sleuths in Lake Forest, Illinois. Please feel free and extremely welcome to submit questions in the Q&A box throughout the, question, throughout the conversation, and we'll get to them towards the end of the hour. And now to introduce our moderator. Kara Ruda is an award-winning USA Today and Amazon Charts best-selling author of contemporary fiction that explores what goes on beneath the surface of seemingly perfect lives. Her novels of domestic suspense include The Widow, Somebody's Home, The Next Wife, The Favorite Daughter, Best Day Ever, All the Difference. Her latest, Beneath the Surface, has been optioned for a feature film. Congratulations. Her next novel, Under the Palms, is out May 2024, and I'll put a link to that in the chat so you can pre-order it as well, followed by the next Mrs. Strom in August 2024. To date, Kara's work has been translated into more than 10 languages. She lives in Southern California with her family. Please take it away, Kara. Thank you, Katie. I will. Thanks for being here, everybody, and congratulations to all of our nominees. I'm Kara Ruda, as Katie said, and I was going to start by just reading the qualifications for the Simon Schuster Mary Higgins Clark Award, because myself and my committee, we had a great committee, and we read through piles of books, and which was really fun. I'd never done this before to get to these finalists. So here is what we were looking for. The winner will be selected by a special um, Mystery Writers of America Committee, that was my committee, for the book most closely written in the Mary Higgins Clark tradition, according to guidelines set forth by Mary Higgins Clark. The award is given by Simon and Schuster. The protagonist is a nice young woman whose life is suddenly invaded. She's made, she's self-made and independent with primarily good family relationships. She has an interesting job. She is not looking for trouble, but she's doing exactly what she should be doing and something cuts across her bow. She solves her problem by her own courage and intelligence. The story has no on-scene violence, and the story has no strong four-letter words or explicit sex scenes. So there you have it. So that's the, uh, I guess, category that we were reading all of your wonderful books in. And now I'm going to introduce all of you guys. Okay, so this is alphabetical order. Lena Chern has been published in Mystery Weekly, The Marlboro Review, The Bellingham Review, Rhino, The Collages, colleges, I don't know. Okay, um, Black Box Literary, you can correct me. <laughs> and The Coil, she lives in the Chicago area with her family. Play the Fool is her debut novel. Welcome, Lena. Thank you. Yay. I'm supposed to <laughs> show my book, so here you go. Show your book always, yeah. Can you give us like an elevator pitch about Play the Fool? Sure. Um, so Play the Fool is a sort of a humorous mystery novel about a kind of a cranky, um, cynical, young, youngish tarot card reader who is sort of in a, at a dead end point in her life. Um, she's kind of living in this um, suburban town with nothing much going on that is not at all similar to where I live. Um, working in a mall, uh, she kind of can't keep a job longer than a few months. She's sort of the black sheep of her extremely high achieving, overbearing family. So she's just kind of had it. And um, everything kind of, she she reads tarot cards kind of semi-professionally on the side. And she kind of considers that to be the only thing she's really good at and enjoys, but it's not something that anybody really considers valuable in any way. Um, so all of this kind of changes when she meets um, someone who works at the mall with her, this woman, Marley, who is kind of an older kind of a cool, too cool for school, elder goth kind of, kind of a, kind of a lady um, who she really clicks with and who is really the only one who kind of encourages her to do what she loves, which is read these cards. And so she, she finally feels like life might be picking up. And that's when Marley turns up dead in the mall dumpster. So she's obviously extremely motivated to solve Marley's murder. Um, and of course, the skills she ends up using are exactly the ones that no one really thinks are very valuable. The same skills that she uses as a tarot card reader, her intuition, her people reading, things like that. So 
that's that's the story. Perfect. Yeah, it was a great book. And I really love the cover too. I thought it was really, really nice. Really nice. All right. Thank you, Lena. Next up is Carol Goodman. Her rich and prolific career includes novels such as The Widow's House and The Night Visitor, winners of the 2018 and 2020 Mary Higgins Clark Award. Ha ha. Okay. Her books have been translated into 16 languages. She lives in the Hudson Valley, New York. Welcome, Carol. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks everyone um, for being here. Here's my book. I didn't put it up at the right time. So do you want an elevator pitch on? I do, Carol. Yes, yes. I do. Okay. Um, never been good at elevator pitches, but uh, so my narrator, Nell, is a, a dean at a small Northeastern liberal arts college, and she is organizing an alumni event for uh, the end of the semester. And it's to honor a professor that she herself had and who died tragically 25 years earlier. Uh, she's hoping actually that this event will not happen uh, because she doesn't think it's a great idea. Plus, there's the forecast does not look good. Um, and she's taking care of a lot of end of semester things when uh, a snowstorm, in fact, does arrive, just as a, a few of the guests come. Um, of some, lot, most of the people can't come, but the important people from her past do show up, minus one uh, person. And so they're all, they end up stranded on this campus during a snowstorm, which is pretty much my favorite setting <laughs> in, in the world. Um, partly inspired by the movie Black Christmas, which is my favorite Christmas book. And so as they, um, they're they reliving their past and talking about this professor who died and how he died, and then and reliving some of the ghost stories they wrote when they were creative writing students, and the events of those ghost stories start reoccurring eerily. And there's one death, maybe another death, um, deaths follow, basically, while they're stranded on this campus. Exactly. Love it. You did a great job. <laughs> <laughs> all right. It's a long elevator ride. Well, no, I know, but it's good because um, nobody's read all of your books yet. So this is yeah. fun to hear about them. All right. Anastasia Hastings, you are up next. She is the author of the Dear Miss Hermione series from St. Martin's Minotaur. The Wall Street Journal says book number one of this series of Manners and Murder evokes the shocking revelations of Wilkie Collins, the social acuity of Jane Austen, and the comic melodrama of Oscar Wilde. Well, that's not even high praise at all. Okay, <laughs> over the course of a 30-year career, Anastasia has also written the Jazz Ramsey Cadaver Dog Mysteries and others as Kylie Logan and the Pepper Martin Mysteries as Casey Daniels. To date, she's published 70 novels. You can get out of Dodge. That's a lot of novels. She is her family's official genealogist. I do that too. I love it. Um, enjoys exploring old cemeteries and has never read. No, here's the dog. Sorry, everyone. Okay, I think they stopped. And has never read an Elizabeth Peters book she doesn't love and lives in the suburbs of Cleveland. Welcome, Anastasia. Thank you. And I'll hold up my book. Ooh, yeah. got a lot of uh, glare on it there. There we go. That's a better one. And my uh, my elevator pitch, um, the heroine of this book is Violet Manville. Uh, well, first of all, the book takes place in England in 1885. The heroine is Violet Manville. Violet has spent her whole life living on foreign shores. Her, her dad was in the Foreign Service, the British Foreign Service. So she has never lived in England. Uh, Papa dies and Violet and her half-sister Sephora come to England to live with their aunt Adelia. Well, Adelia is a bit of a bohemian. And as the book opens, she's leaving town. She's going to the continent with her newest lover, see a kid. Uh, but what she tells Violet right as she's leaving is she has kind of a little sideline job. Uh, she is Miss Hermione, the most celebrated agony aunt in the empire. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who don't know what an agony aunt is, it's an advice columnist. Ann Landers, Miss Manners, that kind of thing. They were huge back then. Uh, so Aunt Adelia leaves, Violet has this job dropped in her lap, knows nothing about it, no, doesn't know what she's supposed to be doing. And the first letter she gets is from a village from a young woman named Ivy who tells Miss Hermione that someone is trying to kill her. 
Uh, Violet knows she can't publish that letter. She can't respond to that letter in her magazine, but she can go to the village to try to offer some advice. And she does, and she gets there right in time for Ivy's funeral. Very nice. Thank you. All right. Next up is Kate Rovards. She is the author of thriller novels, including The Three Deaths of Willard Stan Willa Standard and Only the Guilty Survive, which will be released in the summer of 2024. She studied journalism and works in communications at a nonprofit organization. And she also lives outside Chicago with her family. We have a lot of Midwesterners. That's nice. Welcome, Kate. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Here's my book here. Um, so when my story opens, um, former TV news journalist Willis Stannard is found dead in the bathtub of her apartment, and the police think that foul play is not involved, but her sister Sawyer just refuses to believe that that could be the case. So um, she starts to uh, figure out how Willa was spending the last days of her life. They haven't been all that close in the past few years. So she starts to retrace her footsteps to figure out what Willow was doing in her final days and discovers that she had been writing a true crime novel about a the disappearance of a missing toddler a few hundred miles away. So she thinks that perhaps some foul play may have arised, may have uh, come up from what she found from her investigation. So she travels to the town, starts to talk to people involved, the parents and thinks that maybe whatever happened, whatever Willa might have found out about this missing child's abduction could have led to her death possibly. So um, she just starts to figure out what Willa knew and if it may have led to her death. Awesome, thank you. Nice elevator pitch. <laughs> All right, and last but not least is Mary Winters. Welcome, Mary. She is Thanks. the author of the Lady of Letters historical mystery series. The first book in the series, Murder and Postscript, received a starred review from Library Journal and is nominated for the Mary Higgins Clark Award. That's what we're talking about tonight. Mary is also the author of two cozy mystery series and writes short fiction. Three of her short stories appeared in Alfred Hitchcock's Mystery Magazine. When Mary is not writing, she's teaching, reading, or spending time with her family. She, she lives with her husband, daughters, and spoiled pets in the Midwest. Another Midwesterner. I'm originally from Ohio. I love Midwesterners. <laughs> All right. So, Mary, welcome. Yeah, and thank you. Us. Thanks for having me. Oh, yeah, it's a pleasure. It's so great to meet all you guys after reading all your books. So tell us about well, Murder in Postscript. I'm fighting a glare, too, from the sun coming in, but this is Murder in Postscript, and um, this, my sleuth is Amelia Amesbury, and she, like Anastasia uh, Hastings, sleuth is an agony aunt so it's kind of fun we were actually on a panel once at malice domestic and got to meet so it's kind of fun to see to see you again but um she's a secret agony aunt she's actually also a countess and um she's a widowed countess and so her work has to be kept undercover and discreet and so she is just meeting um kind of a very uh a good family friend uh a wealthy mark request and uh, she sneaks away from dinner to go meet one of her her readers who writes into her about witnessing a murder and so um, she breaks away from dinner to do that and then finds her reader um, murdered and so that is sort of the impetus for the whole um, you know for sleuthing and finding out who who killed the reader so yeah Thank you. I know. Thanks, you guys. And I know elevator pitches are hard. So thank you for doing it so concisely. You know, it's very good. All right. And I thought it would, might be nice if we all kind of talked a little bit, each of you guys, about your process. Like, are you a pantser or a plotter? How long? I know whoever has written 70,000 books could probably has many different versions of how they go about it. But maybe especially for this book that you've been nominated for, if you could talk about your process, how long, maybe how long it took you to write it, or did the idea come right away? Mary, we'll start with you. Um, yeah, so, you know, I am, I'm kind of a mix of the two. I outline, I do outline, and, um, but I, 
oftentimes don't always follow the outline, but I think it's helpful mm -hmm. to have kind of an idea um, and uh, of where you're going. And so I usually kind of just do a basic outline with some plot points. I usually know the ending and I'm always heading in that direction. Um, this was really inspired by a trip to London that I took in 2019. And um, thank God, before the pandemic hit, uh, I was able to go there with my family and um, really kind of discover the, the city of London that I had loved as a very young reader. And um, at the time, I just sort of absorbed London through these books, mostly historical romances um, at the time. And so when I went and saw these places in person, I was really just, um, you know, Regent's Park and St. James's Park and, and Piccadilly. And I, it was just kind of a a memory for me of all these books. And so I came home, I was writing a cozy mystery series at the time. Um, and I, I started jotting down my out, outline and some of these characters. And um, I liked the idea of having an agony aunt because I wanted to include letters um, in the book. And so each chapter begins with a letter to Lady Agony. And um, and that was kind of a lot of fun to play with. And those were, you know, kind of a mixture of just fun inspiration from the columns that I had read at the time, but then also my own sort of spin on them um, as a modern woman, modern, you know, modern reader, not always following the advice. Um, and she doesn't always give the advice that the Victorian uh, agony aunts probably would have given at the time, but I think that modern uh, readers will appreciate her advice. Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Thank you. All right, uh, Kate, to you, what's your process? Yeah, I am a plotter through and through, and my mind is kind of blown when I meet pantsers because I can't even wrap my head around it. Um, so yeah, I, I outline really extensively before I write. Um, typically, like my outline might be pretty long. It goes through, you know, every chapter, what are the key action points that are going to happen? Like, is there a twist? Is there a big revelation? Um, especially just think with, with trying to write a mystery, I need to know where to pepper those clues in so that um, it's not too heavy handed at any point And that, so the end makes sense, but maybe isn't guessed at the very beginning. Um, and I also, at that time, outline character profiles, I outline my setting. So I am, I'm like fully Very fleshed bad. out before <laughs> I sit down to write. Um, yeah. I really don't have a lot of time to write because I do have a day job. So when I sit down to write, I just need to like know what I'm going to write for the hour or so. Um, so I just need to have the outline like really pretty fully realized. And then I can just put the words on the paper and and that's the most enjoyable part to me, but the the plotting and the outlining, that takes me a while. It takes me a couple months. Um, but for for this book here, I, uh, yeah, I outlined for a few months, but I knew the ending from the start. So I just kind of worked backwards. And um, I do have another book coming out this summer, but I knew the beginning. So that one was a little bit different in trying to figure out where <laughs> that one would go as well. So I guess similar process, but just sometimes I know different parts of it. Right. Well, and that's interesting too. Like I, when I started writing, I also had worked full time in the day. And so you just kind of have to find that time. So is that in the evening after work or do yep. you wake up early in the evening? Yeah. 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 Usually I just have to like have everything done for the day and then I can actually like clear my mind and then write because it's my day job I also write but it's very different so I just need to have like a clear fiction mind for <laughs> for for telling stories do people at work know that you do this they do yeah yeah <laughs> they they're very supportive which is fun, that's fun um, yeah. but also now they know a little bit of a dark side of my mind so <laughs> exactly that's, that's the only problem with mystery <laughs> writers because once people find out they're like Oh, wait a minute. I thought you were so nice. <laughs> right. Are you yeah. always thinking about murder? Like <laughs> Absolutely. Oh. Okay. And Anastasia, to you. I your... am a plotter also. Um, and like Kate, I can't imagine not plotting. I think I tried that once on a book and it got ugly fast. <laughs> um, so I spend a lot of time at the beginning 
just sort of free form writing anything, stream of consciousness. Well, this could happen, but why would he do that? Oh, that's stupid. He would just, and then I take that and I rewrite it and I go through it again and again and again. And eventually it gets broken down into chapters. Um, I don't always know exactly what's going to happen in a chapter, but I'll know, you know, she needs to interview the vicar. I might not know what the vicar is going to say, but I know in terms of the story, that's got to come there. And I'm open to making changes if I get somewhere and I go, ew. Um, hmm. But I like to know where I'm going. Um, I find that since I've been plotting and I've been I've been a plotter for a long time, but I can I can write more pages faster. Because like Kate said, you know what's happening. You know where you're going. So that's that's my safety net. I like plots. Yeah. Okay, Carol, are you the same way? No. <laughs> I am a, I am probably, a, I would like to say an unrepentant uh, pantser, but I am a somewhat of a repentant pantser, meaning that there's always some point in the process of writing the novel where I go, what? was I thinking? And <laughs> how am I going to get out of this? So I'm not a complete pantser. I write by hand and I was going to reach it in these notebooks. And so I write, I do write a lot of notes when I'm starting to think about a book. Um, and I will write out possibilities. And um, I usually do have an idea of where I want to end up, although that might change. But I really, um, it does seem to be writing is discovering the story for me. And as much as I would like to plan it out, I, I just, there's some things I just, I can't plan out. Um, plus I think I actually, I'm, I don't think I'm that great a plotter. So if I know exactly what's going to happen, I feel like I would just telegraph it to my reader and they would know <laughs> as well. <laughs> so sometimes I follow one trail for a while thinking maybe this is who did it. And then I decide no and then swerve and go off on another trail. Um, with the bones of the story, the process was a little bit different only because I started the book before the pandemic. Um, and I think I was about maybe almost 100 pages in and then the pandemic occurred. So this is set at a college. Um, and so I realized right away that, wow, all my college students just got sent home. <laughs> so, and I, I became, you know, started doing the class remotely and I realized, no, this can't be set, or at least I can't write it right now. I don't know where our world is at this point. I ended up putting it aside and writing a different book, um, which was about a pandemic, uh, The Disinvited Guest. And I picked it up again a year later. So my ideas about the, um, the book had changed in that course of that time. Plus I spent a good deal of the pandemic Zooming with my um, college friends. We started a, ch um, a Zoom group pretty like within a month or two in 2020 of the pandemic starting, it grew to about um, 30, 40 people. We had ended up having our own reunion after post-vaccine. So here I was writing this, this book about a group of college friends getting back together and then, you know, someone murdering them. I apologize to all my friends, but I ended up um, dedicating the book. Um, the book is dedicated to, for my old college friends, forever young in my heart. So um, that really did change just being in that Zoom group changed my ideas um, about what I was going to do with the book. So I'm a pantser and extremely influenceable. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a pantser too. So I, I love okay. pantsers. I like to scare myself as I go along and not, you know, kind of, but <laughs> I know I do. Like every once in a while I'll be up here writing and I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe like I just did that. And I'll go running downstairs. <laughs> what are you doing now? Anyway. Enough about me, but okay, Lena, to you, what is your process? And are you a plotter or a pantser? Uh, I think when I figure out my process, I'll drop you a line. This is uh, this was my first book and I honestly don't remember how I wrote it. I'm trying to write my second book now and I am I feel like I'm having to learn everything all over again. Um, I will say that I'm kind of an obsessive plotter the way that a lot of, a lot of folks have already said. Um, I think Kate, your process and I are a little bit similar. I my outlines can sometimes get to be like 30 pages long. I need to know exactly where I'm going 
in order to start writing. All of it, of course, goes out the window when I, once I actually do start writing. But I feel like for me, the process is of understanding the story and the processes of actually creating the story are very different. Um, one, I can kind of do with my logical mind typing on a computer. And when I actually get down to the word level, to the sentence level, um, I have to handwrite that because for, for some reason, there is something about that, um, either that sensory input or something about the, there's just a the perfect amount of time between the way my, the speed that my brain works and the speed that my hand works, that I'm able to kind of enter this, the, the state where the good stuff is like where the good writing is. So I, 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 I'm, I keep having to relearn that over and over because sometimes I try to get ahead of myself and, um, try to make up, make up the time or try to go faster or something like that. And I just start typing directly. And then what comes out is usually garbage, at least in my estimation. So I keep having to remind myself that if I want it to be good, which we all do, I have to handwrite. And unfortunately there's no, that takes twice as long because then I have to of course enter it into the computer, but that's just kind of how it has to be. So very slowly I'm learning what my process is. Um, yeah. Well, it seems to be working. You're a nominee, so that's that's amazing, right? So, are you, you writing like on a like a lined notepad, like, or what are you writing on when you're writing freehand? I'm I'm mostly writing on these cheapy notebooks that you can get in August at back to school time that are like thirty cents in big bins at at Target or wherever. Um, and I just fill them and fill them and fill them on until I have a whole stack of them and with with my tiny messy writing that looks like some insane person wrote them. Um, and, the, and, and then of course, if I get really involved in what I'm doing, I can't read my own handwriting. So my process is just kind of a mess is, is the yeah. conclusion. Carol, what were you going to say? Can I ask a question as another, as a fellow handwriter, do you um, write the whole thing by hand and then type it? Or do you uh, type up as you're going? No, I, I really have to type up as I as I go. I have to kind of go chapter by chapter because so many things tend to change along the way. Um, I can't really, again, because the outline is is sort of in my mind, but it's also going out the window and everything kind of changes. I have to kind of go chapter by chapter so that I can and complete kind of one building block before I can put the next one on top of it. Um, and I often go in this very sort of like looping way where I, will finish something, finish a particular chapter or a part, and then go back to the beginning and the, go to the next one and then go back to the beginning of the previous one. It's just, it's mm -hmm. kind of this sort of looping process for me that I've figured out I have to do. Otherwise I can't continue through the story. It's very strange. Is that how you do it too, Carol? I usually chapter by chapter or whatever I've done in a week. I sort of have a um, back when I wrote with when my daughter was in school, which is a long time ago, I would take off weekends and I always wanted to start Monday's typing. So I would write a chapter end with a handwritten chapter and then Monday morning be able to say to myself, oh, just typing. So which it never was. It was always rewriting. For me, it's a it's a, so it's a, a rewriting stage typing it up, uh, yeah. but pretty much the same. I do know an author. Um, who writes the entire book by hand and then types it in. And that just seems wild to me, <laughs> crazy. Yeah. This, yeah. I can't even read my handwriting anymore. I just, I, I think cause I was a journalist, I'm just used to doing yeah. just straight to the typing because it's, I can't, my kids can't even read my handwriting anymore. It's very embarrassing, but so good for you guys. All right, I think we, we are gonna take some questions from the audience in a little bit, but I had one more question, if you guys will humor me. So um, myself and Kimberly Bell and Heather Gudenkopf, we started this thing called the Killer Authors Club. And we have authors on and we ask them questions and we'd love to have you guys all someday if you want to come on. But what we are kind of known for is the killer question of each episode, which is where, why, how, who do you kill? Now we're talking fictionally speaking, of course, or are we? I don't know. But usually it's fictionally <laughs> speaking. So I was going to go and ask you guys to answer. Let's see. We'll say, uh, where do you kill? And um, if you could just give me a really quick answer to that, uh, if you want to have a minute to think. Kate looks ready. Kate? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> that could be where. Where do I kill in the sense that, like, where are the characters or, that or where, where, where do, do I, where do you work? Right. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> oh, that's a great question. Um, uh, it's hard to say because I haven't written very many books, but I think 
in particular, I think I need to kill somewhere that I know. Um, so I feel like that just helps me build out like the whole scene and really feel like I can get someone into it. So, um, in particular, like my, this book that's nominated, um, the setting is somewhere I'm super familiar with. And so I think I just, that, that feels comfortable to me to kill where I know. I like that. Yeah. So you're a comfortable killer, comfortable setting. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Anastasia, how about you? Where do you kill? I've written a lot of mysteries and I've killed people in a lot of places. <laughs> uh, I think so much of it depends on the, on the story. Right. Because, for instance, in I'll I'll pop mine up again. My there we go. In uh, manners and murder, uh, Ivy is pushed into the mill pond and drowned. That works for that because then Violet has that whole village to investigate. Uh, but I've killed people all over the place. I pushed someone off a balcony once and splattered around a marble floor. It was great. Um, <laughs> So I think it really depends on 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 the book, on the tone, on the the detective. How will they investigate this? How does it serve the story? What does it tell us about how she'll find the clues and how she'll discover the killer? So no easy answer. Right. Well, I think because you've written so many books, too, you've just killed, as you said, all over the place. I kill left and right. <laughs> <laughs> You're just constantly killing. And I hope that your family all knows this about you. As my husband said, he's keeping an eye open, which I like. When that. I was writing the Casey Daniels books, the, the first two were out and I gave a talk at a, a library and a man I did not know came up to me and he said, do you have sisters? I said, yeah. He said, you don't like them, do you? And I realized that's who I've been killing off. So there you go. That's great. Okay, Lena, where do you kill? Since you're just well, I well, I only have this one book, so I guess I've only killed once. But um, as I was talking about the setting of this book being this sort of um, uh, fictionalized version of of uh, of the area I live in. It's and I'm in the book I painted. I sort of poke gentle fun at it as being sort of the suburban wasteland. Um, and I just always thought, you know, it's a place where I, I'm very interested in places that a lot of other people don't find interesting um, because I, I feel like there's always some, there's always levels to them. Um, and that's something that I actually found when I was doing research for this book, I was kind of working with the local police department and my goodness, some of the things that I found out go on in my little quote unquote suburban wasteland just blew my mind. And so I, I just thought it was really interesting to try and portray this sort of like underbelly of this sort of, um, you know, very innocent seeming place because it's not, of course, you know, in, in my book, it's very exaggerated and, and humorous, but stuff goes on here that people don't even think about. So I just thought it was really interesting to kind of portray this place as a place where perhaps interesting things do happen. I know. I like murdering in the suburbs too. I mean, because <laughs> things do happen, but you know, like, yeah, you tend to think big cities, but the suburbs have a lot of murder. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Carol, how about you? Um, well, I'm tempted to say I, I, I murder where no one will see me, um, but <laughs> in my books, um, I'm for, I, I, my editor pointed out uh, one or two books ago that I'd been killing a lot of people off steep precipices and begged me to think of <laughs> something else, but a steep precipice is so inviting. Mm -hmm. um, so in this, um, not to give anything away, I... Um, I, I tried to go underground instead. And so there are some ice caves where that are rather perilous. Um, and I've killed lots of people in the Hudson River in my um, bucolic part of the world, or even a person on an ice floe in the Hudson River, which was very dramatic to write. And, and uh, I spent a lot of time down by the river watching ice flows to figure out if that was at all possible. Um, I've, uh, I, I've been watching Agatha Christie and she just poisons everybody, which is seems so convenient and like you can do that anywhere, but I've all, I've had very few poisoning deaths. So I might be branching off in that direction, but I yeah. usually get people in the Hudson river and, and often from a height. Right. Well, effective as well. I mean, I like poison personally, but I think, um, you know, like the more splattering falls, you know, that works <laughs> very dramatic. Yeah, very dramatic. Thank you. Okay, Mary, last but not least. Yeah, 
Um, you know, it's such an interesting question. And I, 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 it does, it depends on the books and the characters. And sometimes I have had those kind of complicated poison murders. And like the next book, I'm like, someone's going off a cliff. Like I am not figuring all this out again. <laughs> um, so, but I, I like to know about the places that I kill. And um, I think it's interesting because, you know, as you walk around your just everyday life and just imagine the sort of, you know, places where where murder could happen, it's it's easier than you think. Um, so I like to kind of know about the, the place, but I also like, you know, to maybe would like to know about, um, I had a murder on a plane once. And I, I thought that was a really interesting idea, like what would happen um, if this, if this person got killed on a plane and, and, you know, how would the logistics, how would that work? Would they stop the plane? Who would get involved? And so um, I, it's, it's, if I don't know the place, then it's a place that I like to kind of learn about the theater. That's another place that I've, I've killed um, a couple of times. And that's another inviting kind of intriguing atmosphere for me because it's just a double uh, you know, this idea of kind of deceit within deceit happening in a theater. So, yeah. yeah. Nice. I like that. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, you guys, for hearing me on my killing question. And now I think it's time for me to turn to the questions. So question number one is for Carol and anyone who would like to answer. Do you have a character or a plot that you've been dying, pun intended, ha, that was even <laughs> me, to write about but can't? And if so, what is your blocker? Ooh, that's interesting. Um, well, I, I've actually um, been wanting to write an historical novel. And my blocker is that um, my publisher doesn't think I'm an historical novelist. So as I've had a little bit of delay on that. So I'm very envious of everyone who gets to write um, historical fiction. And the character I really want to write is a, um, a character based on my mother. Um, and the story would be set in 1941 when she was 18 and, um, she had some involvement with organized crime in Coney Island. So that's the, the character I really, and I've, I've, I have written about my mother in other books, but contemporary books. I really want to write about her, um, in 1941. All right. Well, I hope they let you do that sometimes. Yeah, be nice. <laughs> Anybody else? Stunned silence. I have another question coming in though, so don't we fear. Okay, how many rounds of revisions do you usually do or do you revise as you go when you're complete with the draft? Wait, stop putting questions in. Okay, uh, you feel like you're close to a finished book at least before you send it to the editor. So who wants to take that one? I'll, uh, I'll take, I revise as I go. Okay. So I will write, let's say I write, six pages in a day. The next day when I go back to it, I'm rereading those six pages and making revisions as I go. So when I get to the end of the book, I'm done. Mm. I don't go through it again. I've, I've been through it yeah. billions of times. <laughs> nice. That's nice. Anybody else? I think that's the advantage of being a plotter because when I get to the end, I have to, that's just when I realize what, the book really is about and I just have to start over again and I'll go through it at least two or three times before it even gets to my editor and then there could be three sets of revisions after that yeah I uh feel you Carol that's what happens to me. that's the curse of the pantsers because we you know and then the editor uh, agents editors they all want to know where you're going when you're writing a book I'm like I don't know until I get there and so <laughs> Great. Yeah. yeah. Anything else on that one? Um, I usually write uh, my first draft. I just write it. I don't revise as I go. I just complete it. And then I usually have a second draft where I'm rewriting, doing quite a bit of rewriting. And then just a third draft, kind of polishing little things that I know need to change that maybe changed in the revision. So that's usually how I do it. And that's before you send it to anybody to... Yep. And then I send it to the editor. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say I'm very similar to Mary. Um, I actually don't like reread what I've written the previous days. So I just read it all at the very end. And I just revise at that time and kind of go through a couple of rounds of just myself and then share it with my editor um, and my agent. 
And um, with the three deaths of Willow Standard, it was actually, um, it got edited quite a few times because um, it was my first novel. So to try to get it out in the world, I worked with an editor um, just to kind of polish and give me advice. And then um, I was querying and hoping to get an agent during that time. And during that time, I actually entered this contest through the library for um, unagented manuscripts and um, for the state of Illinois. And I won that, which was really cool. Um, and the prize for that was professional editing. So went through another professional editor. And then after that, I got my agent. So then she gave advice and then it got to the publisher. So I feel like it was, there were many, many sets of eyes on it before it hit the reader. Um, but yeah, I think um, just in general, as I write, I just I put it all down and then look at it later and see, see what makes sense. Great. Thank you. Anybody else on that one? Lena? Um, I, I revise constantly. Like I was saying earlier, I sort of, I have to, I, I feel like I kind of have to get one chapter perfect before I go on to the next one, which is not a method I recommend to anyone because it's really inefficient. I have a terrible, terrible problem with perfectionism. And I'm also a little bit, um, I, I tend to hoard my manuscript until I feel like it's perfect, which is absolutely not the way to do it because I've found, you know, through the, through, through the process of publication that a good editor is, absolutely invaluable to the process. And so I've kind of learned to let go a little bit earlier than I am comfortable with just so that the editor can come in and make really, really great suggestions that often, you know, break things open that I wouldn't have necessarily been able to solve on my own. So as I said, I'm still sort of uh, learning my own process, but these are some things I've kind of learned along the way. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, that's the key of it. It does take a village to bring a book to life. And yeah, it's not a quick. Okay, here's a new question. And uh, let's see, what about your book do you think made it snag the nomination from the stellar committee who was reading them all? They didn't do that. And is it easy for you to see what the readers slash judges like me found especially good about the book? Who would like to take that? So why are you guys here? Like, why did, why did your book win the nomination? Um, well, I can start. When I read the criteria for the award, it definitely made sense to me just in terms of who the character, the, the main character Sawyer was. Um, she's really just an ordinary girl. Her life is kind of turned upside down. It's invaded. She's not a sleuth. Um, and, you know, family relationships are really at the center of the story. Um, so as a side note, sometimes I try not to read reviews, but sometimes I have read reviews and they're like, why would she do that? And I'm like, because she's an ordinary girl. Cause she's not a detective. She's, she's not accustomed to solving mysteries. And so I think that that for me is what makes it interesting. Um, but also I can see, you know, from that list of the criteria for the award, it made sense when I read through it. Yeah, I agree. And that's the thing we did as the judging committee, like make sure we were looking at the, you know, like the criteria, because that's the whole purpose of it. So thanks. Who else wants to add to that? Mary. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, I mean, I would just second, I would just second what Kate yeah. said. I mean, you know, there are, they, they definitely are all amateur sleuths. Mm -hmm. And I think that makes it so interesting to read. I mean, that's what I like to read. That's what I like to write. Um, and because it is different than a detective, you know, um, and it's just, it's that every day, it's that ordinary becoming kind of extraordinary and finding, you know, yourself a fish out of water and, and what would you do? So it's, it's a great um, you know, I mean, it fits all of those criteria. I think all of the books and, and listening and reading to all these books, I can see how that fits in there. Um, and really just, you know, what would you do under those extraordinary circumstances? And then, you know, hopefully building up enough suspense for the readers to take that journey with you. Yeah, exactly. I think, I think too, when um, I'm thinking about the, the category, Mary Higgins Clark wrote so um you know strongly about you know women in predicaments and i think it's that idea and i always feel like i'm i'm always writing from a woman's point of view 
Um, and something has cut across her bow as, you know, most of us in our lives are walking along and something cuts across our bow. And what are we going to do when that happens? Um, and thinking about, you know, everything that, you know, Mary Higgins Clark, who was, you know, widowed with five children and had to keep writing, you know, and, and wrote so brilliantly, um, you know, it's an honor to be considered in, in the category with all of you and also, you know, and uh, with that model of Mary Higgins Clark. Thank you. Anybody else? I do have another question if you'd like me to ask. Okay. So some of you have mentioned reader responses during our conversation. Are there any times when you've had a response that has been particularly wonderful or that has surprised you? Hmm. Hmm. Dumped the crowd with that question. <laughs> yeah, I can I can chat about that a little. Um, so I have gone to a lot of book clubs with local libraries, and it's really super fun. Um, it's kind of my favorite part of the publicity process because I'm not really selling the book; they've already read it. Um, so I get to just chat with people who have read it really carefully and sit down for an hour with them and their responses and feedback is just like mind-blowing. I love it um, because sometimes their questions are things I've never thought of. Um, and so they'll be like, well, what happened between here and here? And I'm like, oh, I don't know. Like, let's talk through. So um, I feel like sometimes they have brought up potential characters they thought could have been a killer and I'm like oh I didn't see that in that way and like it's just really invaluable as a writer to hear that feedback because it's so fascinating to like hear how people interpret the words you put down when you had just one thing in your mind and they have a totally different take um mm -hmm. like for example the store the book is called the three deaths of Willis Stannard it opens where she dies and I had someone say I just wondered the whole time if she was really dead. And I was like, well, I thought that was pretty clear. So, <laughs> so um, yeah, just the different takes people have. I just, I've just found fascinating. I love it. Yeah. Thank you. And, and you, you, you occasionally you get these wonderful heartwarming sorts of messages. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my mom was dying and I was able to take your book to the hospital with me and you kept me company. And that's, you can't beat that. You can't. Great stuff. I think the, the, when I finished my first book before it was even published, I had sent it to a um, friend and he sent the manuscript on to a friend who was, had been struggling with cancer for a long, long time. And the email she sent him back was, um, it was looking like a bad day. And then the, this book arrived and it was a pretty good day. And I was like, oh, my work is done. <laughs> there, there will probably be nothing else I ever hear that is as good as that. So I think, yeah, just that you you help someone get through a you know a bad hour in the waiting room is there's nothing better than that. So. Yeah, I I would agree with that. That you finding out you know somebody sending you that message and your book was that that gift to them that we've all felt as readers first. And that we could do that for somebody or be there at that moment. I think that's just, you just can't beat that. Yeah. Awesome. I, think, um, I think the thing that uh, probably um, makes me feel best, I can't, I, I've gotten some really nice positive messages, but the ones that really um, stand out to me are, are the ones where people feel like people say that they responded to my voice. And I feel like my, my voice is one of the things that I'm sort of proudest of because I feel like it sort of captures something that I, um, or I hope to capture something that I've kind of been feeling all my life is, is sort of that idea of feeling just a little bit like an outsider or feeling like a little bit like you don't quite belong wherever you are. And, and that's something that I feel like my character kind of embodies. And it always, um, it always makes me feel good when someone says, oh, I kind of identified with that. I, I feel like that sometimes too. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of a way to, um, that people can find something in common with each other or with, or with my character. And I feel like makes them, makes them feel like they might belong even when they feel like they don't belong. Mm 
Mm. Pretty, yeah. And sometimes even bad comments end up meaning something. I I did a series once, and in one of the books, I had the hero and heroine break up. Mm -hmm. And I so many terrible comments. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I threw the book across the room, that kind of thing. But what it makes you realize is these readers really cared about these people. Mm -hmm. So yes, I'm sorry you threw the book across the room, but I love it that you were <laughs> so involved with all this. So even bad things can be helpful. Absolutely. Yeah, just not too bad. Some, some, yeah, some not, 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 yeah good. <laughs> not good. Okay, last question, you guys. And Catherine has been very patient because she keeps putting the question in. <laughs> oh, God. Okay, so how did you fall in love with the mystery genre and what other genres do you love? Hmm. Carol? I, I think um, my mother just read Agatha Christie. I just grew up with Agatha Christie in, in the house. Um, and it, although it took me a long time to realize that that is what I wanted to write, um, that it was just always there. But I love, I just love everything. I love horror. I, lo I love, you know, romance. I love li even literary books. <laughs> I love them too. Um, maybe I haven't read, well, I was going to say maybe not Westerns, but then I have read Lonesome Dove. So, I, you know, just I read eclectically. Great. Anybody else? We have just a few minutes left. But you have, you can talk though. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Mary, I feel like. Um, yeah, no, I, I also, um, it's not just the mystery genre. I just love reading in general. I think, you know, um, I, I'm in the Midwest. Um, I'm in South Dakota and um, I've had to stay put a lot of times when I've wanted to go and books have been that transport for me to other places and other people and other cultures. And so, for me, it's it's just been a big part of my life. Hmm. Yeah, I feel like that's with all authors. Everybody reads well and broadly, and yeah, it's it's like a big part of our lives. Books and and that's kind of what what happens here. Oh, and I, apparently we do have one more question, so now we're going to go to this. Okay, you're all readers, which we were just talking about, of course. Is there any author that you've written to or told in person how much their work meant to you? I, I have an Elizabeth Peters story because um, I had a friend who was an entertainment editor at a major newspaper and she knew I loved Elizabeth Peters. And at the time, Elizabeth Peters had a new book coming out and she called me and she said, hey, you want to do a phone interview with her and write it up for the paper? Well, sure. I practiced for days <laughs> like Hello, Miss Peters. It's so nice to meet you. Why, Miss Peters? Thank you for. She picked up that phone, and I said, "Oh my God, I love you." <laughs> she said, "Oh, honey, we couldn't have started this interview any better than that." Oh, so. That's awesome. That's great. The ultimate fangirl. Yeah. Anybody else have a fangirl moment? Yeah. When I, I was when I was when I was thirteen years old, I actually. This actually partially answers the previous question as well. I actually didn't grow up reading mystery. I read a lot of science fiction when I was a kid. That was sort of my main genre that I was interested in. And when I was 13, I wrote a fan letter to my favorite author of all time, who was Harlan Ellison. Wow. And he's sort of a fa he was sort of a famous cranky pants, but he was very kind to fans, especially young fans. And he wrote me this really, really kind an encouraging letter because I asked him all kinds of stuff about how do I become a good writer like you? And I'm so terrible. And I, and I can't, you know, how do I, what, I, how do I make sense of all of this? And it was just this really nice, encouraging letter that I feel like was sort of the start of my um, writing career. That's when I really felt like maybe if he believes in me, then it's possible for me to actually be a writer. And the weird little postscript that I won't get into in great detail was that I actually had a very strange encounter with him later on in life where he was sort of less nice to me. <laughs> um, and so it was just this sort of very strange story arc that I have with him. But I definitely feel like that, that letter, that fan letter really kind of changed my life. Mm. Love that. Yeah, several years ago, I had the opportunity to meet Jeffrey Eugenides at um, a book signing event, he was doing a rare appearance. Um, and I just I've read The Virgin Suicides about a million times. I just feel like it's so well written. And so when I got up for him to sign my very old copy, I told him just, I felt like every word in there he had thought through. And 
when he signed it, he wrote, and I told him I was, you know, wanted to be a writer and that, you know, it was just really inspiring because, you know, sometimes I feel like you can read books that feel like they're a little turned out, but I was like, oh, like he thought through every single word. And so when he signed it, he wrote, you know, Kate, every word matters. And I was like, oh, this is so true. I love it. And as my own funny postscript, when I was talking to him and like fangirling over his writing, he interrupted me and he was like, I really like your raincoat. And I was like, whoa, and it, feel, it felt like I, in my mm-hmm. mind, it felt like he was going to write a character one day wearing my raincoat and that I was going to read it. And it was going to be just like the greatest moment of my life. But I haven't read that yet from him, but <laughs> you know, I feel like it was impactful. Wow. <laughs> Okay, and you guys, this is um, the last question, I promise. Okay, um, what is the book you're working on now or a book that you have coming out soon besides these books that we've been talking about? And let's see, we can just start with Kate because she's on my screen. Yeah, um, on August 6th this summer, I have a new book coming out called Only the Guilty Survive. It's another thriller mystery. Um, It follows a, the mysterious death of a cult um, 10 years later and follows their sole survivor and um, a podcaster comes to town to tell the story of what happened to the cult and the murder of that survivor's best friend and yeah I'm really excited for it. Yeah it sounds great thank you. Okay Anastasia? Well speaking of cults (laughs) <laughs> uh, the second the second book in the Miss Hermione series is out. It's called Of Hoaxes and Homicide. It came out I don't know, a couple a month or so ago. And uh, in it, Violet gets a letter from a mother whose daughter has joined a cult. So she has to run off and go to this cult to uh, investigate. But it's fun. There's a lot of magic and there's a ghost in the abbey and the whole deal. So fun book. Great. Thank you. Lena. Um, I'm actually in the middle of working on my sequel to Play the Fool, which has the same characters and is actually also based on um, kind of it's kind of a true crime thing. It's based on something very, very strange that happened in in, um, in the crime community here about seven years ago um, that actually made the national news. But it, it was something that affected me quite deeply. It was this this sort of like hero cop who <clears throat> was murdered in the line of duty and then all this stuff started to come out about him and his what he was really like. And that was just something that really, really stuck with me. And getting back to that point of how things go on here that maybe people don't think about, it was just a real, a really, really evocative story. And so I want, I knew I wanted to write about it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And so I kind of ended up shoehorning my own characters into that story. But that's sort of what I'm working on now. It's called Tricks of Fortune, and it should be out in January of next year. Awesome. Thank you. And Carol? Um, so my next book, Return to Wildcliff Heights, which is just as gothic as it sounds, um, is coming out in um, at the end of July this summer. And it's about a young woman who goes up the up to the Hudson Valley to uh, work with a reclusive author on uh, the sequel to um, her favorite book. So it's it's kind of about uh, somebody fangirling over a an author. Sounds great. Thank you. And Mary? Um, so the second book in the Lady of Letters series just came out in February, and that's Murder and Masquerade, and um, takes place around a theater, which was a lot of fun to write. And then um, I'm working on the third book in the series right now, Murder in Season. And so um, that will come out in 2025. Perfect, thank you. And thanks you all for a great talk. I need to do the business part now. Okay, so join us tomorrow for a conversation, not us, but the other people. For a best <laughs> novel, you can find out more by visiting mysterywriters.org. And remember to tune in to the live broadcast of the awards ceremony on May 1st to find out who wins. And a reminder of everyone's website so you can check out this nominated books and forthcoming works. Okay, um, boy, let's see. It's lenachurn.com, carolgoodman.com. Um, okay, Anastasia is us.mcmillan.com backslash author backslash Anastasia Hastings. That was hard to read. Okay, and then um, krovards.com and marywintersauthor.com. 
And thanks so much for everybody that tuned in and for asking the questions. And you can register for all future panels at mysterywritersofamerica.com. It's the links in the, the chat over here. Please follow the Edgars on social, hashtag Edgars2024, and visit the Edgars Awards, uh, sorry, edgarsawards.com and our YouTube channel. Okay, that's it. I think thanks everybody for.